Sign languages are non-verbal languages that are essential for non-caring people to connect with their social environment. Understanding how sign languages have developed, what properties they have, and how they are used is extremely important for us to understand the nature of language and communication. In particular, we want to know how sign languages differ across cultures in the world. Today, we are extremely excited to present a lecture, Sign Languages of the World, by Professor Arno. As many of you know, um, uh, Professor Arno is Distinguished Professor of Linguistics at Stony Brook. He has been an affiliated faculty uh, for MIC since its inception. Many years ago, I had a privilege to serve as his TA. I remember that his lectures were always very inspiring, and all students appreciated his teaching as well as his warmth and kindness. Professor Arno has been on the Stony Brook faculty since receiving his PhD in linguistics at MIT. His research touches on almost all aspects of morphology and its relation to phonology, syntax, semantics, and psycholinguistics. His research monograph, World Formation in Generative Grammar, published by MIT Press in 1976, was a sea changing publication and has been extensively cited in the field year and year after year. Professor Maha Arno maintains a secondary research interest in writing systems, especially how they relate to spoken languages and linguistic awareness. His recent morphological research projects and publications have dealt with the nature of morphological stems and roots, the morphology of sign languages, and affix order. For the last dozen years, he has been a member of a team studying a newly created sign language, Arusai Bedouin Sign Language. I am happy to tell you that today's lecture by Professor Arno is simultaneously interpreted by two sign language interpreters, Ms. Suzanne Dooley and Ms. Donna Walbert. So um, today's lecture will be very uh, exciting and informative for us and very happy to have this lecture by Professor Arno. Now, without further ado, Let's welcome Professor Mark Arno. Thank you, Erico. Uh, it's a special honor to be introduced by a former student. So, thank you. Um, okay, I think I will just dive right into this. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to give you kind of a very broad overview. I'm going to, uh, I'll be fairly quick, uh, and then I'll talk about one particular language that I have worked on for a long time. Whoops. All right. <laughs> OK. Uh, so sign language is nothing new. This is a, a picture from a Greek vase. Um, and, uh, see in Greek uh, the uh, uh, names of these, these people. These are, these are two, this Dionysus over on the side here. Um, and these are two uh, companions of Dionysus. And they're arguing over this guy over there who's playing the flute. Um, and uh, you can see that the woman standing all the way off to the side is making this sign with her hand. Uh, and uh, interestingly, this sign still, so this, this vase is 2,000 years old. This sign is still used in Naples today to mean something like um, married or a couple. And so this woman, one of this, 
uh, you can see it becomes much more animated. This one woman is gesturing to the other, uh, and basically what she's saying is, buzz off, he's mine. <laughs> and the other one's going like, I never met anyone. <laughs> I wasn't starting anything whatsoever. So, and this is 2,000 years old. Um, but of course, we have no records other than a few pictures like this. Um, well, okay. All right, we'll see. All right, I'll use this. I'll use this. Um, oh, 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 oh. Okay, I'll just use it. That's fine. All right, so this is Very good. Okay, so I'm going in the wrong direction, mind you. All right, so you can see basically what I've already told you about this particular sign. And this is St. Jerome, if you don't know, was the man who translated the Bible into Latin. Uh, and it says here, uh, for the, uh, the conjunction, the joining of the fingers themselves, uh, uh, and, and the soft, joining softly, uh, marital pinyin. You know, uh, de depict uh, a husband, uh, a husband and wife, maritum et conjugem. So this is from St. Jerome from about 400 AD. So this sign has been around for a very long time. Okay, now up until really the late 1950s, people used to think there was only one sign language in the world. And this included even uh, famous deaf advocates uh, and even Leonard Bloomfield, who was one of the founders of modern linguistics, who said gesture language is so uniform, right? And of course, he had it all wrong, but that was what even linguists believed. So the question is, is that true? Um, and the answer is, of course not. Um, so famously, British Sign Language and American Sign Language, despite the fact that the two countries share spoken language, are not mutually intelligible at all. Uh, there is, there was for a while a world sign language that people tried to uh, promote, but that never got off the ground. So how many sign languages are there? Uh, for this we go to Ethnologue, which is kind of the standard catalog of, uh, of all the world's languages. Um, and uh, I'm not going to bother to do that, but it, it shows you that there are at least 150 distinct established sign languages, probably close to 200. All right. Now, what about the sign languages of the world today? Well, a good number of them um, really have or can be traced in the way that we trace all languages to one of five, and these are the five that are given. Now, interestingly, this analysis is based on manual alphabet, so it's not a standard type of analysis, but it is pretty interesting. Um, so this is, uh, and this is recent, right? and this just shows you what the different sign languages are and their different origins. Um, and this depicts the movements, and you can see these sign languages, how they move from one place to another. One that, uh, that I've worked on a little bit that isn't depicted here, but is I think a nice example, um, if you, uh, Israeli Sign Language, which is used by uh, several thousand people in Israel, actually came from Berlin. Uh, and that was because uh, uh, there were German deaf people and educators who fled Germany in the mid-1930s and uh, started a school in Israel. And that's how a lot of these, play, these languages start. Is by, that's how American Sign Language started, was they came from France because educators from here went to, to, to France and then found a school here. So that's how these things often happen. Um, since uh, this lecture is at least closely related to the Department of Asian and Asian American Studies, I thought I would talk very briefly about sign languages of Asia. Um, and uh, it's in it's East Asia. I'm not talking about uh, South Asia or Southeast Asia. That's a whole other story. But there are basically two groups. 
there's Japanese and Korean sign language, and then there are uh, Chinese sign language, right? Um, and just to give you an example, again, the Chinese sign language you can trace to a school that was founded about 150 years ago. Um, and most of Chinese sign language came sort of um, spread from this uh, school that uh, was in Shanghai. And today there are really um, two major dialects. Now, Japanese, Korean, and Taiwanese, um, again, Japanese emissaries were sent uh, to European schools, but we don't know exactly where they went, and we can't figure out exactly where the language came from. Uh, and, of course, the language fed, spread to Korea and Taiwan um, because of Japanese occupation and colonialism. All right, I'm going to very briefly explore some myths about sign language. I have a lot of material on this particular thing. It's quite fascinating, but um, I'm afraid if I spend too much time on it, we won't get to the, to, to the cool stuff. So, a lot of people think that sign language is a form of mind, right? Uh, and just to show you that it's not true, um, I'm going to, in this particular slide, you're going to see three different sign languages. Um, and you kind of should, should guess. Uh, whoops. There it is. Okay. Everybody see that first one? All right. So every, they're all shaking the finger, right? So the question is, what is it? Right? And the answer is that the first one is ASL. Where? The second one. Um, is Italian Sign Language not? And the last one is Russian Sign Language what? Right? So yeah, they can all, everybody can be shaking a finger, but it doesn't mean the same thing, right? All right, now here's another um, problem, we'll call it. So yes, there's a lot of iconicity in sign language, but it, you know, the icon depends on what you focus on, right? So here is Israeli Sign Language, which signed for bird. And American Sign Language Sign for Bird, and you can see that they're really kind of looking at, focusing on two different aspects of birds. You know, birds fly, and birds have bees, right? And, and so, uh, so it depends on what you think about the birds, right? Here's another example, um, which is the sign for tree. So here's Chinese Sign Language, Danish Sign Language, and American Sign Language, and they all have a different word for tree. They're all iconic in some way, um, but they are iconic in different ways. So another example is the word for chat. There's French Sign Language, um, the Netherlands Sign Language, and ASL. They share one feature, which is back and forth. So they all have a back and forth, but the back and forth is going is actually going in three different uh, axes, right? So uh, so that's kind of cool. So again, they're iconic, but they don't choose the same dimension. All right, second myth, which is very important, is that there's some connection between the spoken language and the sign language, and the answer is no. Um, uh, so here it is. French and French Sign Language. And you can see uh, that, that the order is completely different. Uh, I can tell you about just briefly in my own work when we started working on this Benoit Sign Language that we'll talk about. Uh, the first big discovery that we made was that the word order in the language was different from the word order in the spoken language of the village. So the spoken language of the village is a colloquial, basically a, a Palestinian Arabic, which like like many languages is SVO, like most colloquial varieties of Arabic. And it turned out that the sign language was SOD. And this was good enough that we were on the, we had a big picture on the front cover of the science section of the New York Times telling the world that this language was SOD. I don't think it's anyway. So, yeah, uh, but sign languages and spoken languages can be very different. All right, I'm going to go very quickly through this, but 
any language is made up of these basic signaling units, which are then put together to make meaningful signs, right? Uh, now, in speech, basically the way it works is every, and all languages work like this, every language has a set of sort of simple sounds, which goes from a dozen or so, Hawaiian as an example of a language with a very few, a small inventory, we say. English has 40 or so, that's not the biggest there are languages. Some languages in the Caucasus that have somewhere over 70 of such things, right? Okay. Uh, and basically, the way you form the, the signs is to take these units and put them together. So, here's an example, a well worn example. You can take the sounds t, a, and k in English, and you can put, together, put them together in at least three, at least three different ways. You can say cat, or, at, or cat, or at. Interestingly, and linguists make a big deal about this, you can't do all possible combinations, right? So you can't say ta and work ta. Um, though you probably, if you were speaking Russian, you could say ta, but not in English. You can't do it. Right? So it's not. It's these basic sound units and their combinations. Right? Okay. Now uh, we won't talk about this because it's too complicated. But similarly, in uh, the same words for sign language. In fact, this was the great discovery that William Stokey made, who was really, in many ways, the founder of sign language linguistics in the late 50s. Um, he figured out that sign language, American sign language, and he coined the name American sign language. American sign language had similar units to the sound units that we have in spoken language. And the point is that every sign in, in the sign language is made up of these kinds of components, right? So, all right. So, the way language, sign languages work is you have a, uh, a, a hand shape, and these are various hand shapes uh, that you can use. These, the, uh, I won't go through this in any detail. You have a location, which is where uh, you, the, the sounds are made, and then you have the manner of, you know, of movement. And different signs are we can we can tell that signs are different because we can construct what we call minimal pairs, which are which are signs that differ only in one of these things. Okay. Um, so in English, for example, I can say tap, tap, and cat. They mean three different things. So I know that p, t, and k are three different basic signs. Uh, and I can use what we call manner to distinguish them and voicing as well. All right? Now, we can do the same, and I'll show you a few examples of this. So here, is it, here are two signs in American Sign Language which differ only in handshake. Right? Here's candy, and here's apple. Does everybody see that? They're made on the same location. The movement is the same. There's a slight difference in the mouth, but we won't worry about that. Um, but, the, 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 but the handshake looks totally different. Okay? We'll do a couple more of those. Um, twin. Everybody see that? Uh, okay. I'll give you a few more, and then uh, just in the interest of time, if these slides are going to be posted, right? Or you can know. I mean, we can post them, and then if people want to look through them at their leisure, um, they they can. Okay. I don't mind if they're posted. So here's father, mother, and fine. There's father. This is American sign language. His mother, so the, the hand looks the same, it's just in a different position. And here's fine, right? So it's here, right? So fine. Okay. Um, here's dry. And here's 
ugly, right? <laughs> they look very similar, but they are in different locations. Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot more time. We could. Um, well, let's, let's do this, because uh, I like this one. So that's May and coffee, <laughs> right? You can see that. Very silly, I'm Moscow, I ran by Okay. Um, I'm, not, I'm going to skip through the, uh, these, uh, as I say, we're going to post these if you want to look at them at your leisure, please do. All right, now, my particular research, our particular research is concentrated on a type of language that we call deaf, uh, um, uh, that, that we call sign, village sign languages. And those are different from the sort of standard sign languages. And the standard sign languages are sign languages that, that, are, um, that, that are part of an organized deaf community. So what do I mean by a deaf community? Well, what I mean mostly is, uh, sorry, deaf organizations, deaf schools, those sorts of things. And those are most of the sign languages that we think about, like American Sign Language and British Sign Language uh, and Chinese Sign Language. The kind of sign language that I am interested in, that I've worked on with as part of a team, is a different type of sign language. And um, these, we used to call them deaf, uh, village sign languages, but the name these days, they're, they're, most people call them shared signing languages. And these are languages that have emerged um, among deaf people in um, small communities, with not based in schools at all but this sort of where, and usually for genetic reasons. So I'm going to talk about two such languages. Um, one of them, this one is no, the first one is no longer in use, but this is an amazing language, it's an amazing place. So Gardaya is a, uh, a village, is a town, it's not a village, it's a large town um, in the Sahara, it's right on the edge of the Sahara, in Algeria. It's like the last major town before you get to the Sahara. And it's always been quite isolated. It has a fascinating history. It's hundreds and hundreds of years old. Right? All right. So uh, this is what it looks like today. Um, and you can see where it is. OK? Uh, so uh, here it is. Everybody see where it is? So you see, so this is the coast. This is where most people in Algeria live. These are the Atlas Mountains. Then there's a flat, then there's another mountain range. Right and right here, right on the edge of the Sahara, is this town called Garba. Right? Okay. Now, this town was founded by a, a sort of a, uh, a fairly obscure Muslim sect. And these people actually went there specifically because they wanted to get away from everybody else. Right? And that was a thousand years ago. The town always had a large Jewish population. Uh, so by about 1960, there were about 6,000 of these. Now, uh, this is from a monograph, which I recommend very highly, uh, by a man with the wonderful name of Lloyd Cabot Briggs. If anything reeks of Yankee money, it's the name of Lloyd Cabot Briggs. Okay. Um, and he was an anthropologist who uh, worked in this town and discovered these, uh, a, a, a deaf uh, community within the Jewish community within this isolated town. Right? Um, so there's an example of uh, sexually a wedding. Uh, now, these people all left in, about, in the mid-1960s. There was a war in Algeria, the Algerian War of Independence. Um, the Jews all felt threatened, and so they all left. They just, you know, planes came in and they took them all away. Um, they all, mostly all of them, went to Israel. Uh, some of them went to France. And this, they took the sign language with them. So uh, a colleague of mine actually had the opportunity to study the language of one of the last of these people, but they're gone now because they had no reason to use their language. Here's another famous example from over 
there. Right? Right. So, this is Martha's Vineyard, uh, which everybody knows it's where the Obamas have their summer house. Right? And, uh, and, but it was, high, it was highly isolated. Uh, it was inhabited uh, by, uh, uh, by uh, British colonists uh, in the early 1600s. It was isolated for about 300 years. And the people on Martha's Vineyard developed their own sign language just because there was, again, it, it was for genetic reasons that they were deaf in the first place. When the population, um, when, when, when you really have a, a, a narrow range of who you can uh, mate with, uh, these genetic anomalies get amplified. So now Martha's Vineyard sign language, again, disappeared. Though there's a wonderful book uh, by Nora Gross about it. Uh, uh, recently, there's been new research on it. It seems to, I, of course, it, is, it, is, it changes the picture a little bit, but I highly recommend Nora Gross's book because it's actually both of those books, uh, both the Briggs book and her book. Okay, who are these people? These are the people that I know. These are the people that I work with um, in a uh, Bedouin village near Beersheba, all right? So this is a community, it's spelled Al-Sayed, but that's the standard, it's actually pronounced Isayed. So, uh, but the spelling, that's just, that, that's the way it is. Uh, and it's a community uh, that was founded um, near uh, uh, Beersheba in the Naked Desert, I'll show you exactly where it is. Um, and uh, we know we have a genetic profile of the entire village uh, that was done by geneticists who later became the dean of the medical school and then the president of the university uh, in Beersheba. Uh, but uh, so we uh, we can actually uh, what happened was that about 75 years ago, four deaf siblings were born in this village, right? Uh, and there are now about 200 deaf people in this village of about, or it's, it's a town really, of 4,000 people, right? Um, and again, uh, this is all genetically based. Uh, and we, all we have, we have one video that I'll show you of one of the members of the first generation. I wrote here that it's now his fourth generation, it's actually now his fifth generation. We haven't been back since the fifth generation was born. Uh, we, we really lost the village about five years ago. And it's used throughout the village. Uh, so I remember one of the first, the first time we ever drove into the village, we're driving and of course we're surrounded by kids, right? And, you know, the, the, the car is just surrounded by kids. And all the kids are signing. They're all signing. There's like two dozen kids and they're all signing. And, and we was thought at first we thought, oh my God, they're all deaf, right? This is paradise. And then we suddenly we realized that well, no, they're not all deaf. They're all signing, but they're not all deaf. Uh, so so many, anybody who has a deaf relative signs, regardless of whether they are deaf or or hearing in this village. So this is where it is. Um, so let's see if I can. Uh, this is a very localized map. Uh, so, uh, Beersheba is, is sort of here. Uh, Jerusalem is up there. Uh, the Dead Sea is down there. Uh, and uh, outside, and this Messiah is here. This actually means literally the deaf person, this next village. Uh, but there aren't as many, nearly as many deaf people as there are in the side. Uh, as I mentioned, so this is this community is uh, socially isolated, but geographically not. If I tell anybody, anybody in Israel knows this intersection is the intersection of two major highways, one of which goes to the Dead Sea and the other which goes up north, uh, eventually to Tel Aviv. And I tell them, you know the McDonald's over there? <laughs> and they say, oh yeah, I know that McDonald's. And I say, well, that's where the village is. It's right next to the um, there's no signs there. You can't tell that it's, that, that it's there, but that's where it is. All right? This is 
what it looks like, there is the village. No paved roads. Uh, when we first went there, there was no electricity or running water. Now there is. Um, but, okay. So who are they? Uh, now this is, this is in the words of the principal of the high school whose father was one of the first deaf people. Uh, and he tells his story of the origin of the village, which is actually pretty, I think, as far as we can tell, very accurate. Which is that this man was, he really fled Egypt. Uh, he sounds like Moses. You know? uh, so he fled Egypt because uh, he was implicated in a murder. And he went to this place, which is actually not, I mean, it's across uh, the, the, the Sinai Peninsula. But, so he went to this place. And we now know, by the way, that, that, that it, it, it was, Egyptians were encouraged to move to this area by the Turks um, because uh, they were trying to keep the, uh, the Saudis out. That's the uh, And he moved, and, and uh, he married, so he came, he says, with his small family, a wife and a few kids. But of course, he moved to this village, and he married lots of wives. Um, they still do that in the village. Uh, polygamy is, is, is common. Uh, many people, many men have two wives. Um, my colleagues, my research colleagues, all of them are women, they say that, that when they first got there, they said, oh, these poor women, you know, three, or three, two or three women have to marry this one man. And I said, yeah, but what about the poor man who don't get to marry anybody? <laughs> I think about it, right? Okay. Anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, and basically, one of these women, there was some the genetic, uh, a recessive gene that was clearly carried by one of these women, and five generations later, you got deaf people. And that's what happened. So here are some pictures of the village. This is, uh, uh, when we first got to the village, they treated us like, like we were special. Right? And so they would make us coffee, which involves, in their culture, not you have to roast the coffee, then grind the coffee, and then you, 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 you make the coffee, and then you serve it. After a while, we were just like, you know, the guy next door. Who's going to make coffee for the guy next door? Yeah, come on, what, what? But that was early on we were treated that way. Here are our kids. As I said, the village is filled with children. Um, this is a street. I say none of the roads are paved. Uh, these are some olive trees over here. Right? Uh, I think you can see the McDonald's off of the Chicken coop. Right? Uh, another chicken coop. Some people have money. Um, Interestingly, so one of the one of the, you know, the this was this very young girl we used to work with like a dozen years ago, um, and she got married last month. And I was talking to uh, one of my my, my colleagues, uh, uh, Carol Patton, and Carol said, "Yeah, you know, she got married to the guy from that house." <laughs> uh, so, uh, as I say, people are well off. Uh, we are treated amazingly well. Village. That's you can't see us, but that's us, <laughs> right? Uh, so we go there, um, hang out with people. Um, this is an interesting uh, picture. These are three brothers, and the they, these two older ones are deaf. Uh, the uh, the the middle one uh, is hearing. His shirt, by the way, says. Makavi Haifa Kadurega Moadon Kadurega, which means uh, football team, yeah. right? So it's the uh, Haifa Makavi football team, right? Okay. Um, uh, English doesn't do much good in this village, by the way. Uh, most of the men speak Hebrew because they work outside the village. Uh, uh, everybody in the village who is not deaf speaks. Uh, the local, uh, it's sort of a peculiar Palestinian dialect that they speak, right? Um, but so he, so he is hearing, 
but his signing is just as good as his brother's, right? And and these people, the the, one, the hearing signers, are a treasure to us because uh, we can do all kinds of interesting work with them, and they are very helpful to us in understanding the the uh, sign language. Uh, this is one of the people that we work with a lot. Um, he is deaf, uh, and he drives a road grader. Uh, and you say to yourself, you know, big deal. All right. And apparently, he could grade a road without any level, which meant that you know you have to grade a road like this. You don't grade a road flat. Right. Uh, so this is the deaf people are full functioning members of the community. All right. This is my late colleague. Unfortunately, she passed away about three years ago. Um, he was here working with kids. There's the camera here. She's got the computer. She's got the kids, right? There's. This is our research laboratory, <laughs> uh, right? Uh, and now we get. The, this was using. This is oh, over ten years ago. You know, nowadays we would just use the, the iPhones, right? We don't need these kinds of cameras anymore. Uh, right? And this is my job. Um, <laughs> So I, you know, I was very, very, very good at holding babies and falling asleep. <laughs> if after those meals that they feed us, you can see. Uh, I also drive the car. That's kind of I'm the, the, the driver. Okay, so who are these people? Uh, as I sort of hinted before, there were four siblings born into a single family because of uh, recessive genetic trait. Uh, due to parallel cousin marriage. And you know, people say, my God, parallel cousin marriage, how you know, barbaric. And I say to them, do you know who married his first cousin? Charles Darwin. And we would not have modern biology if he had married his first cousin because she was the richest woman in England. And he never had to earn a living his entire life. Right? Uh, parallel cousin marriage is the most common form of marriage in the world uh, for reasons, and it's usually not bad. I mean, it usually actually amplifies good traits. It also happens to amplify bad traits. And say, people say, where did they, they get this? And I say, well, they live near Beersheba. Go and read the book of Genesis. When Abraham wanted to marry, what did he do? He went back to Beersheba and married his cousin. When his son, Isaac wanted to get married. What did he do? He went back to Beersheba and married his cousin. So this tradition of, of, of uh, parallel cousin marriage in this area uh, goes back at least 4,000 years. All right. So there's a huge percentage of deaf people in the community. Uh, it's like, you know, uh, 100 times normal. Uh, again, uh, for uh, for genetic reasons, um, and these people are completely integrated in the community. They interact with one another. They 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 lead you know they they just lead regular lives. Okay, so uh, and uh, this is the most important thing. This is from the first article written by doctors about this village. So what's important about these people is that they are otherwise, they have an otherwise normal phenotype and are normal intelligent. In other words, these people are deaf, they are stone deaf from birth, but there is, they have no other issues whatsoever, right? So that's, that's uh, and that's often true of, in fact, usually true of people who are born deaf, right? Okay. Uh, we know exactly why they're deaf, and we can read this in great detail. It's a particular problem that was discovered uh, about uh, 25 years ago uh, by a local researcher. Okay. Now, socially, as I said, this is amplified by the social structure of uh, the village. Uh, and, uh, you get because of the, the marriage patterns, there's a great likelihood of this recessive gene pairing. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go through this uh, in detail, but basically, uh, it 
it's interesting to us because this area was settled really fairly recently, um, uh, only about between 200 and 300 years ago. And it's interesting, we call this language, we, when we first named, we named it because the people in the village, what did they call it? They call it our signs. That's what they call it. They didn't think there was a reason to give it a name. Um, and we, uh, it's a very interesting story, but we eventually agreed to give it a name. Um, and we called it Esai, then we went sign language. It was only maybe 10 years later that we found out that these people aren't really bad. They're sort of bad. And that itself is interesting because what happened was, because they weren't accepted by the Bedouins, they were even more isolated. So because they weren't accepted by the local Bedouins, they were really sort of the, the cousin marriage profile was, was amplified. Okay? Um, okay, I'm going to, I think, show you this. This is a video of one of the first signers. It's very cool. Uh, we uh, got to... Uh, we wanted to copy with a, a video set VCR tape. They wouldn't. They were worried that something would happen to the tape, so they let us um, film it off the TV screen. Which, if you're a fan of Seinfeld, you know the episode where they're right. They're pirating the, the movies, but so this is pirated off the TV screen. Uh, and so this is one of the first signers. Uh, it's the father of the high school principal. Whoa, what has happened? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Come on, come back. Um, there it goes. It's not mimetic at all, and as, as my colleague Carol Pan said, when we, when, when we the first time we actually saw somebody uh, speaking this language, Carol turned to the rest of the team and said, this is the real thing, I don't understand a word, right? But this, had, this is 50 years, it's amazing, right? In 50 years you go from this highly mimetic system, um, well this the end, years, uh, 
Uh, not that I will, but if anybody goes back in 20 years, will they find the sign language there? Probably not, right? Because the, 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 the deaf people in the village are going to all be using Israeli sign language, which is fine for them, right? I mean, that, but uh, it's not fine for the language, but that's, you know, I mean, that's the way these things tend to, to I think, these, 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 um, these types of, of shared sign languages, they kind of, you know, they emerge and then they disappear. That's kind of what seems to happen. All right, I'm going to give you, how much time do I have? Five minutes? More, more? Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you a little bit about the grammar of this language, just to give you a flavor for what it's like. All right, first, we're going to look at complex words. Uh, uh, compound words, which are basically two words put together to make another one. And in, in all languages, in all new languages, those are the first complex words that you have. Um, so we see this in, in, in Creole languages as well. Right? So you take two words, put them together, you get a third word. Right? Now, what's interesting about this language is it's a brand new language. And so we can actually watch this structure kind of coalescing, right? It's not like people walk in and they say, okay, we're going to make compounds. We're going to take word one or word two, put them together, and then make word three. No, we can actually see how, how they're kind of struggling to do this, right? Uh, so what we do is we give them something that, that we don't think they have a name for, right? Uh, so this is a calendar, and we say to them, you know, what is this? And this is what we get. So they just take a bunch of words and string them together. Okay. So they have, you know, they, this, they know, they're trying to describe it. Similarly, what is this? Everybody in the village has one of these. It's a little gas yeah, stove, right? Everybody has one. Uh, and we ask them, well, what is it? And this is what we get. Turn, cook, and you could see some of them are just two words, but some of them are three or four, right? Uh, and we actually don't have any com compounds that are uniform across the building. But we do have some that are interestingly conventionalized within a household. So what's the, one of the most important things in a household? It's the cattle, because you boil water and you make tea, right? And everybody drinks drink tea. Constantly and coffee, right? And so everybody has a kettle. And what's happened is that in different families, they have different ways of saying kettle. Right? So each, oh, there's Nora, that's the girl who just got married. <laughs> She was like, what, six in this? Right? Yeah, she just got there. Okay. Um, so basically, you can see that there are, um, within two different families, one family gives you cup plus four, four, four from handle. So that's this guy in blue here. That's one of the brothers. Remember those three brothers? He gives you cup, cup, four from handle. And the other one gives you cup, brown. So each family, you can, why, you know, it makes perfect sense, right? Each family has developed within the family its own words. All right, here's another example. It's a word for banana. Discovered this was we gave people 
uh, some, we made video clips. And we gave them the video clips and we asked them to describe what's going on in the video clip, right? So I'll leave you with that. That's more. Man, woman, man, shirt, give. She does it more than once, right? Woman, man, shirt, give. We'll play her again. By the way, it's a wonderful example of iconicity and historical change. So if you see the sign for woman that she makes, it looks sort of like that, right? And that's because 100 years ago, um, Bedouin women, when they were married, were, were given a tattoo right here, so that's the sign of woman. It's no, it hasn't been true for 100 years, but that's what this Man, why? Remember, where did this, when did this village start? During Ottoman Turkish time. Well, they all had Turkish mustaches, right? Uh, so these signs, I think, you know, they're, they're, they're iconic, but iconic from 100 years ago. They're no longer iconic. You know, the one sign that is iconic is the sign for boy. Right? Everybody get that? <laughs> Anyway, uh, so you can see basically that what the girl is saying is woman, man, shirt, give, right? So it looks like the subject of, and that was our first result, um, which we published in uh, uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and as I said, that was featured in, uh, on the front page of the New York Times Science section. All right, I'm not going to, I'm going to stop here because I think I've, I've exhausted you. I will just tell you that we, about 10 years later, we figured out exactly what was going on with that SOB stuff. It turns out it's not SOB. It's much more interesting than SOB. Um, and uh, I will say only that it's all about the monsters. Okay, I'm going to stop here because I think uh, I, I, I've exhausted you, uh, and thank you. It was really interesting. I always thought that sign language is so difficult, but actually your lecture really opened my mind. I would like to try, especially when I got children, uh, hearing and not hearing, they are uh, signing together, natural, not forced. And you know, this is really uh, amazing and also we can see some culture in it. And it's really, the literature was really inspiring. Thank you very much. And we have some time for questions. Before we get to questions, I just want to put in a plug for my colleague, um, Jenny Singleton, who is sitting here. She just arrived. Semester, um, and she will be teaching courses. Uh, uh, she does research mostly on uh, children and how they acquire sign language. And she's going to be teaching courses in the linguistics department um, on sign language. So. That, that's really great, exciting. Yes, uh, she's uh, much better than me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have uh, language students and students from linguistics and languages and and. Yes. Um, Brendan, about our so life will be. Um, yeah. I can just talk. It's okay. Can you hear? All right. Yeah. So, so thank you, Mark. I have two questions. So, uh, when people who use different sign languages come together, what happens? That's the first question. The second one is, you know, in the hearing uh, world. We think of language as having a huge amount of symbolic power. We use language to construct positions of power, privilege, authority, and differences, and so forth. How does that work in sign language? Well, I'll answer the second one first. Uh, it works in the same way, pretty much, as in spoken language. Uh, and just to give you one example, um, we know about American economic and cultural imperialism, uh, and uh, it turns out that the dominant sign language in the world today is American sign language. Because people give power to American sign language in 
much the same way I think that they give power to American English. So that's well. Now, the other example, I, Jenny can probably answer that better than me, but I always have anecdotes about my colleague, uh, Carol Patton, um, who is a member of this core team of four of us. Uh, oops, sorry, I'm drinking more. So I can talk to the three people. <laughs> and um, Carol uh, basically can find deaf people anywhere in the world. Right? We, we, we travel together, we'd be in an airport. Um, and I remember once we were in the airport, we were in Rome going to Sicily, right? And like, you know, I was worried about her. I mean, you know, she's in, she's in, she's in Italy, she doesn't know, she doesn't speak any Italian, she's, right? And she disappears. She dis 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 disappears. And she comes, and I'm looking for her, for, she comes back like 15 minutes later and says, Oh, I found these Italian deaf people, right? And she was having a conversation. One day we were in Beersheba, which is big town next to the Bedouin village. Um, and this car stops next to us. Uh, and uh, how much she's signing to these people? Um, and uh, uh, about, you know, she has a brief conversation with them. And then two minutes later, she tells me a story about who these people are. Uh, she didn't know they were. Uh, so there, there are people like Carol who, uh, because I think sign language is more iconic, uh, we're really able to uh, kind of figure out. And also, signers, okay, I'll say this. I believe signers tend to be much more tolerant and cooperative uh, because it's just sort of the name, it's like they know that, 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 that not a lot of people you know, know sign language and they, they sort of they cut people a lot more slack when they're signing, uh, I think, uh, than, than hearing people do. And that may be partly, you know, related to sort of this whole power thing. Uh, but because, yeah, okay, I'll stop. I'll come for this side. I'm wondering if you could solve the mystery for me. Um, there's a project that I was running until about five years ago called Panplex, and it was what it does is collect um, lexemes, millions of lexemes from thousands of languages, and, and out of dictionaries, and, and creates a multilingual uh, dictionary allowing inference where no attested translations exist. When, when I was running it, we basically got stumped by sign languages because the prerequisite for inclusion was that each lemma has to have a representation as a string of Unicode characters, and we couldn't find any either practical or scholarly orthographies that did that. I'm wondering why it is that. Uh, I don't know, Jenny might be able to answer better than me. It's a mystery, actually. People have tried for many, many years to create a practical orthography uh, for sign languages. Um, and there have been, you know, every, every once in a while you hear the things. So somebody's come up with this, you know, based on dance notation or something like that. Um, and it, it, it just hasn't quite worked. I have my own ideas about why that be, might be, but they're kind of, uh, they're so radical I don't want to tell you. <laughs> But I want to know about your project. I mean, this is fascinating. Where was this run out? It's, uh, it's running, it's sponsored by the Long Now Foundation in San Francisco. Oh, okay. Uh, it's affiliated with the Rosetta Project there, and it's run by the biggest David Camels. Um, and so it's just been working for several years to collect all, you know, basically mine. Uh, multilingual, bilingual and multilingual dictionaries to create a kind of super dictionary that uh, allows you to translate between, you know, Mongolian and Nahuatl or whatever. Right. Uh, sure. Yeah. Let's talk more about that. Okay. I know very little about sign languages, so I'm curious Me about, too. about <laughs> one thing, which is how can you distinguish between um, a series of words 
and a compound word. Like in the example you gave, woman, man, shirt, give. There might be a concept called woman man, right. or there might be one called man shirt. So how could, how could how do you distinguish? Um, by, so I'll give you an example from spoken language. So do you agree that there's a difference between white house and white house? Right. The white, white house is a compound, right? And it means a specific house, right? Uh, if you want it, there's a pink house, maybe. Um, yeah, so a lot of it has to do with what we might call prosody or intonation in, in, in Spartan language. It turns out that uh, signing has the equivalent of prosody. Uh, my colleague Wendy Sandler is, is a, a big expert on this. Uh, and the other thing that happens is in established sign languages, very often when you make a compound, you kind of smoosh them together. What's going on here in a side is because it's all brand new, um, it's hard to tell. But one thing that's very cool is that, is that the order of constituents in, in the compound in, in ABSL is different from the order in a sentence. Um, so in, in normally the order in a sentence would be uh, noun adjective, right? Uh, so you know we would say housewife, uh, but in compounds they do the opposite order. So there's actually a grammatical difference that's emerging. That's one of the cool things, of course, and uh, you know that the structure is emerging. It's not gelled completely, but we can see if you do statistical analysis that within within compounds there's a much higher frequency of the of, of the modifier head and the hand modifier that you get in the syntax. So yeah, there are ways of teasing this out, but um, yeah. Thank you, Mark, that was great. Um, so a question I have is about in your, um, uh, in the community, do sort of more distant folks Hearing folks who have less, who don't have an immediate family member who have picked up some of the signs, you know, so everyone can sign some. But would the would these more distant folks show evidence of more conventionalized forms or less conventionalized in the sense that if they only see it every now and then, they just kind of remember and sort of consolidate and kind of have less variability, or is it always like here they are variable because they're always kind of iconic and sort of acting and, and trying to sort of be understood. Yeah, it's so, a great so which way does it go? Right. So it's a great question. I don't have an answer, but we'll go back and find it out. The thing about this, the village is that we have to work within the social structure of the village, right? So um, it took us a year to, until we didn't get in. And we, everything is done by social networking. And basically, we network mostly with deaf people. Uh, so by now, there are a number of deaf people that we know very well. I mean, you know, that, that, that's the point where we talk to them on the phone regularly. Right? When we first went to the village, we were amazed. They all had video phones. Because, of course, it's Israel in there. You know, they were always much more advanced in telephone technology than we were. Uh, but nowadays, everybody has video phones. So, uh, but we, so, it's actually very hard for us to get to work with people of the type that you describe who don't have much contact mm -hmm. with, with deaf people because it's just in terms of how many nodes we have to go through. Uh, we, we, sort of, we don't know those people. Right. Um, and so uh, we can't really work, we can't just walk into somebody's right. house. Just network is not like Yes, yeah, okay. but we can try. Yeah. Yeah. Just trying to figure out. Yeah, no, no, I. Which way I would predict. You know, right, so. right, right. Great question. So, thank you, Mark, for the great talk. So, my question um, is about the banana sign that you showed, and you showed how it's signed by uh, some mature signers, where they, they're good viewing the banana, and then the younger kids are kind of making it a little more stylized. It looks a little less iconic than this to me. 
So I'm just curious if, as the language gets more and more developed, the, the degree of life in the city, do, 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 that will go down over time, or is it that sign languages will maintain that same, about same amount of life in the city, regardless of how many generations of signers? There's a lot of studies on iconicity, especially historically in, in American sign language. Uh, so there are these old, old movies from like 1910 of, of uh, people giving speeches. Uh, and uh, and that there had been research comparing those with the modern ones. And I think in general, yeah, the iconicity goes down, uh, uh, but the, the, the sort of structure gets yeah, but these kids, I, I mean, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> right, but Karen today understood the chat room. Yeah, 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 yeah. everybody knows what a banana is. You know? yeah. We did a lot of work on words for fruits, like, you know, lemon, lemons and, and, and oranges and, and tomatoes and things like that. And you've got this big, wonderful sort of uh, cloud. Thank you so much. 